Well, thank you, Krishna. It's a great pleasure to be here to speak to this audience. Um, often I'm, uh, I find myself having to speak uh, entirely to audiences of physicists, and sometimes it can be hard to get across the interest of the controls and systems aspects of what we do. So it's, it's nice to have the inverse kind of audience today, uh, where I've tried to go light on the physics a little bit, but to emphasize more how kind of controls, methods, and concepts really uh, can have some impact on the, uh, the growing field of quantum engineering. And in fact, today I'll try to make a case that control ideas and concepts and methods are really very central to quantum engineering. And uh, I'll show you a little bit about how we're trying to develop that as a kind of a new uh, core area of the, of, of the, of the subject. Um, so this is work uh, that was started at Caltech and has continued at uh, Stanford, and I just wanted to acknowledge that various phases of this have been supported by the NSF, AFOSR, and uh, DARPA uh, Microsystems Technology Office. So uh, back when I was at Caltech, uh, I, I uh, participated in teaching a course called Introduction to Feedback Control Theory, and on the very first day, we would start out with a slide like this that asks simply, what is feedback? Um, there's a dictionary definition of this, which actually is very close to the one that I'd like to adopt for the talk. And it says, the return to the input of a part of the output of a machine system or process, uh, and the uh, general idea being to improve somehow the performance of this first system. And so, you know, uh, feedback systems can be somewhat uh, complicated to analyze and design, because in these closed loop sorts of configurations, you have that system one affects system two, system two affects system one again, and so you have to be careful about how you talk about cause and effect in this sort of a feedback loop, and you need some theory to really understand how to analyze and design these systems properly. Now, as a physicist, you might look at this uh, list of bullet points and say, well, you're just meaning that system one and two are coupled somehow. Right, they have some interaction. But really, for the purposes of this talk, and really, I think, for the purposes of most of control theory, you don't want to consider arbitrary sorts of uh, interactions between uh, two different systems. But you really have in mind this sort of a loop where your first system has an output signal of some kind. And the output signal then drives a second system. And then the output of that second system travels back around to close the loop and drive the first system again. Right, so there really is sort of a directionality to this, uh, this flow of information. And so that's really what we mean by a feedback interconnection, as opposed to some very general, just kind of physical direct coupling between a, a couple of, uh, of dynamical systems. Now, um, when we give the introduction to this course, we, of course, throw up a few examples. Uh, and so one kind of example to consider is maybe typified by a thermostat, so the kind of system that controls the temperature in this room. And system one, you know, the, what we'll call the plant, the, the system that we're trying to control, it uh, might consist of the, you know, the, the thermodynamics of this room. So it includes things like the way that heat diffuses from one part of a room to another. It has convection currents and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the controller, right, the thing that we're trying to use to control it, it's of course the thermostat. But then, you know, the general control system can be broken down into the temperature sensor and the thermostat, some sort of electrical circuit which processes that information, and then the actuators themselves, which somehow are up in the ceiling, you know, they're heating and cooling elements that then drive hot or cold air into the room. But you can see there's obviously a closed loop because whatever warm or cold air we blow into the room, eventually that signal makes it back to the, uh, to the thermometer in the thermostat. So it's a closed loop system. We think about it as a feedback system, and we can use all of our, our familiar control theory to help design these things. But, and and I, I would say that most feedback control systems that we consider in engineering today are like this in the sense that the overall system is very heterogeneous. Right? So the plant system that we're trying to control, the kinds of physics that we use to describe it are these thermodynamics-y kinds of things, a little bit of fluid mechanics, stuff like that. Uh, on the other hand, the controller is really largely a, an electrical circuit in terms of its nature, and then the actuators are, are yet something else. And, you know, that, that's not a problem, right? Our control theory can deal with that just fine, but let me just point out that that's a, a particular sort of control system where the system one and the system two that we've talked about are really very different from one another in their physical nature. Now, in contrast to that, we can go back to a much older example of a feedback control system. So this is the famous example of the watt governor for the steam engine. Uh, and for those of you who have, haven't seen diagrams of this before, the basic idea is you have a steam engine. Uh, people had had the idea of steam engines for a long time, but they have the problem that they tend to be unstable. And that once they get going, you know, they can kind of run away and, and blow up if you, if you don't impose some sort of feedback regulation. Uh, and uh, a type of regulator that uh, works very well for this is if you have a, a steam engine that has some power output, that power output is turning a wheel. What you can do is have a shaft attached to this wheel monitoring the power output that spins a shaft, 
And that shaft has this sort of a little gizmo where there are two ball masses and, and this hinge apparatus. So you can just imagine if this is the drive belt that's spinning that shaft, if the shaft is spinning very slowly because the power output of the steam engine is low, then the angular rota the, the rotation of the shaft is very slow. And so those two spherical masses don't really feel much centrifugal force and they stay down. On the other hand, if the power output of the steam engine starts to run away, then this uh, drive belt will turn the shaft very rapidly. And of course, as it's spinning, you'll just see that those two ball masses will get lifted up uh, just because of the centrifugal force. But by this sort of a clever hinge arrangement, you can make it so that when those ball masses go up, that has, is connected by a bunch of mechanical linge, uh, linkages to actually then close a valve, which will somehow regulate the steam engine to push its power output back down. So we can see this again as a sort of a, a feedback loop where you've got the steam engine and the fly ball governor. And you know, in a certain sense, there are signals traveling around. You recognize it as a feedback control system. But now you really see that you know, everything is mechanical here. And so you have an interesting kind of arrangement where the controller and the plant are actually made up of the same kinds of parts. And so on the one hand, you can say, well, this is a primitive example of a control system, the kind of thing that we had to use before we invented electrical circuits and computers and things like that. On the other hand, uh, much of what I'll try to get across today is as we look forward to a future era of quantum technologies and nanotechnology, quantum engineering, et cetera, we're actually going to be much more going back to this sort of a scenario where we would like to have all of our controllers be embedded Right? That is, we would like uh, to have the controllers, which regulate or stabilize our nanoscale quantum processes, we would like to be able to make those controllers out of nanoscale and quantum parts so that everything can really be bedded, embedded down in a nanotechnology. Uh, and you know, we'll have to learn how to live with that. So to give you a concrete example of the kind of thing that uh, I'm talking about, here's just an example of a, a, a really a, a toy experiment that we did a few years back. Uh, it was motivated by an example in a, a seminal paper by Matthew James, Henry Nerden, and Ian Peterson uh, talking about um, what I'll call coherent feedback control. So this is feedback control, just as I've introduced in the past few slides, but the main differences about it are that we're going to think of the plant and the controller both as being quantum physical systems. And I realize that not everybody in the room will know anything really about quantum physical systems, but don't worry about that. Uh, you're not going to have to, I think. And the other thing is that the signals that travel around the loop, rather than thinking about those as your typical electrical sorts of signals, the signals will actually take an optical form. And in fact, uh, we'll find that for the kinds of systems we'd like to envision, you have to treat the plant, the signals themselves, and the controller all using a quantum mechanical uh, uh, formalism. So, so here's a, a really a toy example of that kind of thing. And so uh, you know, the, uh, if this is the usual sort of signal flow diagram that we show in our Introduction to Control Theory courses, where G, again, is the plant system, it has an output signal that goes to a controller system. The output of the controller system comes back to drive the plant again. Uh, so the plant that we'll have in mind will be a very simple optical setup, uh, something just called an optical ring resonator. And so what I'm drawing here are just uh, four mirrors. So there are two flat mirrors and two curved mirrors. They're all highly reflective. And if we uh, sort of align these carefully, you can make it so that there is a resonant mode where if I have a laser beam traveling like this, uh, the alignment of the mirrors is such that will kind of close a, a figure eight pattern so that the light after it's gone around uh, this, uh, uh, this arrangement comes back to exactly the spot where it entered in the first place. And uh, then you have a resonant condition where if the wavelength of the light that you're using fits an exact number of times into the overall length of this figure eight pattern, then the cavity has a resonance and it, it responds uh, very strongly to, to input light of that, of that particular wavelength. And it's, it's a dynamical system. In fact, you can show that uh, from a control perspective, this thing is a second order system, which is to say that it responds as if it were a damped harmonic oscillator. And in particular, a response that we might ask about is, suppose we just take a, a laser and shine a laser into this input mode. And you know, this laser is close to the resonance, but let's, let's say that it's a noisy laser. Right? One thing we can ask about is the open loop transfer function from this input to that output. So simply, if I shine a noisy laser into this input of the resonator, how much of that noisy light makes it into this output here uh, such that we would detect it with a photodetector? Right? So in terms of the diagram over here, if we cut off this feedback loop, so G here would just represent this optical resonator, and this would be my noise input, this would be my measured output. And so in the absence of the feedback, there's some degree to which noise coming in the noise input makes it out to my photodetector. Uh, 
So in order to close the feedback loop now and talk about stabilization or something like that, or technically this is a disturbance attenuation problem, I can note that, well, if I shine a laser into this port, you know, some of it will couple into the resonant mode and circulate around the cavity, but some of it clearly also gets reflected at this mirror. And so I have this measurement output Y, but in fact, Y is a little bit complicated because it has a prompt reflection from the input signal, but you can also see that light that has been circulating in the resonator, right, some of it when it travels around will transmit through this mirror and also come out this output port Y. So Y is kind of a slightly complicated sort of thing. It contains both a direct sampling of the noise input and also a sampling of the kind of past values of the light that's been circulating around the cavity. But anyway, it's some optical signal. So we can take that optical signal and try to drive that into another resonator. And then uh, we can take the output of that resonator and inject it into this kind of back port of this uh, original plant cavity. And now we can ask, well, how should we design this optical resonator such that when we close this optical feedback loop, we try to optimally suppress the extent to which input power here actually makes it into the output Z. Right, so we'll look at this closed loop diagram where K is now an optical resonator, just the same kind as the plant resonator G, and we'll understand the signals that travel around these loop to actually be optical signals. And so you can use some very basic control theory to do this design. Um, in this paper here, they actually used a quantum mechanical formalism and did this design in the H-infinity framework. In fact, uh, if you sort of look at this as an experimental optics person, you'll just recognize, well, this is just some giant interferometer. And I can use uh, kind of basic optical physics ideas to ask, how should I design this thing over here so that um, I make a dark fringe coming out this port? And again, as a physicist, you might at first guess, well, this kind of looks something like a balanced bridge. So maybe what I want to do is make this cavity look exactly the same as that one. And in fact, that's not the case. If you solve it exactly, you want this cavity to be a little bit different than that one, where that little bit of difference kind of accounts for the fact that um, a signal that goes around the loop once can actually come around again. And so you have to kind of renormalize for that. But anyway, you know, the design problem is actually uh, fairly simple. So uh, first of all, what does it really mean to say that this is a coherent feedback loop? Uh, well, so one of the elements that we need to include in this, in the actual experimental arrangement, is you'll see that this steering mirror here, which kind of directs the output of the second cavity back into the first cavity, uh, that thing's on a little bit of a, 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 a piezo translator so that we can very finely uh, adjust its position. Why do we need to do that? Well, since this thing really is like a giant interferometer, I actually need to control the overall path length that the light travels on around the loop, and I need to try to stabilize that uh, to be either an integer number of optical wavelengths or, or uh, an integer plus a half. So let, let's look at that and just sort of what the output looks like. So uh, here's a, a plot, for an experimental result from that experiment. And so, um, Let's see, so uh, this axis is power. This is the power that you measure at this output photodetector from the plant cavity. And so this bottom black line, that's just the electronic noise floor of that detector. Uh, now, if we don't have the feedback loop, right, so if we just block this output signal Y and don't allow light to travel around the coherent feedback loop, then the power that you detect at Z uh, is at this black level here. And now what's plotted in the red is I now allow this coherent feedback loop to close, so I let the light go around the loop, but now I'm going to look at the power detected here at this detector as a function of the position of this, uh, of this uh, path length adjusting mirror uh, that was in the, in the other diagram. Right? So in practical terms, I scan the voltage on this PZT. That has the effect of adjusting the round trip phase of the light from being kind of a positive feedback to a negative feedback. And so you find that you know, there are points where if I have a, a nice negative feedback, right, I really do reduce the level of power detected at this photodetector relative to the open loop level. On the other hand, if I get the overall phase exactly wrong, I'll have a positive feedback. And in fact, I see a lot more, a lot more noise transmitted through the cavity uh, compared to what it was in open loop. Right, so that sensitivity to the overall round trip phase of the feedback signal, that's kind of your simple indication that this really is a coherent feedback uh, kind of arrangement. And you know, a lot of the concepts that may be familiar to you from basic uh, feedback control theory, you can reproduce them in this setting. So for example, if I want to know uh, what is the transfer function from the noise input to the, uh, to the measured output as a function of frequency, I can do something like this. So uh, this axis here corresponds to um, kind of a swept sign input. Zero is the exact frequency of the cavity resonance, so I can sweep from below the resonance to above the resonance. Uh, and if I do that in open loop, uh, I'll get this uh, red trace here. Uh, 
Uh, and so there's just a, a Lorentzian, kind of as you would expect for the transfer function of a harmonic oscillator. Uh, there are a couple little bumps there. Those are just frequency markers that we put on with a, with a modulator. So you can actually ignore those little, those little shoulders. But now if I uh, do exactly the same kind of swept sign transfer function measurement with the feedback on, and if I lock the feedback phase into this uh, negative feedback condition, then I get this, uh, this uh, black trace down there showing that the feed through of noise from the input W to the output Z is suppressed over a broad range of frequencies. And if I take the ratio of the closed loop response to the open loop response and plot that as a function of, of, uh, of frequency, then I find that I'm getting you know, some fairly effective uh, suppression over a range of frequencies that's 10 to 20 megahertz wide. And so now this brings out another sort of reason why one might be interested in this sort of uh, coherent feedback control. Um, you know, if you've never done experiments with optics, uh, maybe this won't be familiar to you, but if I had tried to do this sort of a feedback using measurement, Right, so a thing that I could have done was uh, with the noise input to the plant and this output signal Y, rather than sending this output field Y through another cavity and routing it back and sort of doing things in an all optical way, a different thing that I could have done was just to stick a photo detector here, measure something about the light coming out of the plant and converting it to a, a, a traditional electrical signal. I could then use some sort of a signal processing circuit to decide what to do about that. And then I could synthesize a new uh, laser beam and send it back into the output U, and I could try to close the feedback loop that way in, a, in an incoherent fashion. Right? Had I done it that way, you know, the path length and stuff like that certainly wouldn't be sensitive to changes on the, on the wavelength scale. But you know, if I'm trying to do that and I'm trying to achieve a bandwidth, like a, a, a unity gain point out in the 20 megahertz regime, that's an extremely difficult thing to do, or at least you have to be careful about your electronics if you do that. Whereas the experience with playing with this system in the lab is if you just kind of let the optics do this feedback loop, you don't have to try particularly hard to get tens of megahertz of bandwidth. Right, so coherent feedback also has the advantage that since all of your signals are always traveling at the speed of light, and all the processing is happening by kind of natural physical processes, it, they, that kind of a feedback loop can be really much faster than other sorts of uh, strategies that you might try to use. Now, um, and then even though, uh, you know, really kind of what we're talking about here is a big compound interferometer and we're just talking about injecting noisy lasers, there's also, there's a certain quantum mechanical aspect to all of this, right? Remember, I, I, I suggested that uh, the kinds of systems that we would be most interested in, uh, in this kind of arrangement, would be ones where the plant and the controller were made out of the same kinds of parts, the signals traveling around the loop would be optical, and in fact, we would eventually want to describe the plant, the propagating signals, and the controller all using quantum mechanical physics. And so even in a very simple uh, setup like this, you can show that if you look at the performance of your feedback control at very, very low input powers, right, when you're really talking about a situation where you can sort of think about discrete photons traveling around the feedback loop, you can show that there's an advantage of the coherent feedback setting in terms of functioning equally well all the way down to the limit of zero noise input power. Whereas if you were trying to set up a photo detector here uh, to do a measurement-based feedback, and you wanted that detector to be of a sort that could really uh, accommodate arbitrary sorts of noise in the input laser, you would find that the coherent feedback loop actually performs much better than the measurement-based one in this very low uh, power limit. Um, the basic idea of that for people who know about quantum optics is you know, to account for both phase and amplitude noise on this laser, the kind of detector I need to put there would be a heterodyne detector. If I think about a heterodyne detector setup, if I just you know, think about zero noise, and zero injected optical field into the plant, I'm still gonna have some shot noise coming out of my heter uh, heterodyne detector. That in turn will have to get translated into some now added noise input going into the interferometer. And so the measured noise that I get at this, uh, this uh, photo detector will never go all the way down to zero. Whereas if I'm doing this just by wrapping a giant interferometer around my plant, if I have no light coming in, there are no photons anywhere, and obviously I'm never gonna detect anything out there. So this is an extremely simple example of a coherent feedback loop, but you know, I, I think it already introduces uh, some basic ideas that the interconnecting systems that we're gonna think about will be optical input-output devices, uh, the signals traveling around the loop will be optical, and somehow we'll be interested in general in uh, the behavior of such systems in limits where the quantum mechanics is important. Now, uh, I won't have time to go into this in any detail, and in fact, the story is not quite done, but let me mention, uh, again, just drawing connections between things. So I said that the um, original theory paper that motivated that example experiment was looking at control of linear stochastic quantum systems in an H-infinity setting, 
Uh, you can also do the necessary calculations for the design just in terms of direct manipulation of Laplace transfer functions, which is how I did it. Um, there's also an LQG setting for this sort of uh, coherent feedback control. And in physical terms, this kind of means uh, there's a setting for thinking about coherent feedback control where the systems are all oscillators. And so I mentioned that these sorts of optical resonators uh, that I introduced in the previous slide, they have dynamics which is equivalent to the uh, dynamics of an oscillator. And these days in uh, the kind of world of experimental nanoscale physics, you can also make mechanical oscillators that are really nanoscale to the point where people are starting to be able to observe uh, quantum mechanical behavior of those mechanical oscillators. And so there is an interesting setting for all of this coherent feedback control theory where you might think of uh, you know, your plant system as being a mechanical oscillator, uh, coherent feedback loops in terms of optical signals probing the mechanical oscillator, you would process those by putting them through some sort of optical device, and then you would um, shine your laser back onto the, the mechanical oscillator. And um, there are scenarios there for doing things like cooling a mechanical oscillator where you can prove that there's a gap uh, between the best possible performance for a measurement-based controller, you can prove that a coherent feedback controller uh, will be able to do better than the best time measurement-based controller. Uh, but that, that story is not quite wrapped up yet, so and it, it gets rather technical, so I won't go into it here. But you know, if you're interested, uh, certainly ask me about it later. Now, those of you with a physics background will maybe also recognize that um, if I want to sort of look for quantum effects in my my experimental system or my engineering system, staying in the world of linear dynamics is not a good way to do that <laughs> because the quantum mechanical, the differences between quantum physics and classical physics are extremely subtle if everything has linear dynamics. But um, let me just make the point that it's not so difficult these days to go into the laboratory and do experiments on quantum mechanical systems that are strongly nonlinear. You know, so these will provide interesting kinds of uh, systems maybe in which to interconnect in these sorts of coherent feedback loops. Uh, so a couple of examples of recent work that we've done in our group. Uh, so here's something where you again have an optical resonator. Uh, so just a couple of curved mirrors facing each other. So again, we can think about driving light into this resonator and looking at the light that comes out. But now, rather than having that just be an empty resonator, what I'll do is introduce into the in interior of that resonator um, atoms of some kind. In fact, you can do these kinds of experiments just with a single atom uh, user using laser cooling uh, techniques. And so now here's an example of something. This is just a single data trace, where what you do is you have a single atom in the optical resonator. You shine light in, and you look at the light comes out. And the light going in is completely uh, constant in all its parameters. And what we're going to do is measure the phase of the light that gets transmitted. And uh, what this trace here shows is the blue is the actual measured phase of the light coming through the cavity. The red is a sort of a fit to guide the eye. But what you see is that the phase shift of the light coming through this cavity is being modulated in a telegraph kind of process. Right? It sort of jumps between uh, two, two different mean values. And in fact, the phase swing there uh, can be quite large. It can be 20, 30, 40 degrees. Uh, what is causing uh, these uh, switching events, where the phase uh, of the output fields goes from positive to negative, it's actually single spontaneous emission events of the atom that's inside the cavity. And so you can do some quick calculations to show that the energy dissipated through each such phase switching event is just a quarter of an attajoule. Right, so working in these quantum optical systems in a highly nonlinear regime of behavior, you start to see, see that um, input-output characteristics of a thing that looks like an optical device, you can show interesting sorts of behavior like phase switching. Right? I mean, phase switching is a thing that people like to do in optical communication systems. Uh, and the energy scales associated with these processes in these strongly nonlinear, strongly quantum systems, they can be incredibly low. So uh, experiments like this uh, start to bring in the idea that, well, using these tricks in modern experimental quantum optics, we can start to think about experimental systems that are of interest not only because they're nonlinear and quantum, but also because the kinds of uh, energy scales you can get to maybe are appealing for thinking about next generation uh, signal processing devices that you might uh, use for telecommunications or, or photonic interconnects or something like that. Another example of a similar thing, this is again in one of those single atom cavity QED types of setups. Um, uh, many of you may know that back in the 1980s especially, there was a lot of interest in using a particular nonlinear optics phenomenon called optical bistability as the basis for constructing switching devices, again, for use either in optical communications or optical computing. And uh, one of the hallmarks of optical bistability is that if I have my optical input-output device, 
I shine a laser in, and I look at the power that comes out, and now I ramp the power of the input laser up and down. And in a bistable regime, what I can expect to see is a hysteresis loop, such that as I'm sweeping the power up from low to high, I get a, a certain output characteristic curve, uh, shown for example here in the red, but then when I sweep it back down over the same range of input powers, I don't reproduce the same curve of output power values, but I open up this kind of uh, box-shaped loop like this. So in single atom cavity QED, you can uh, find this kind of phenomenon, and in fact, you can find this kind of phenomenon happening in, happening in a regime where you know, the power levels or the energy scales associated with the difference between the lower branch and the upper branch of this hysteresis curve, that can correspond to something like 10 photons in the cavity. Right, so you're happening in a, in a strongly quantized regime, and uh, you know, there will be quantum fluctuations of the photon number. Right? So 10 photons in the cavity really means kind of 10 plus or minus 3. You have square root of n Poisson sorts of fluctuations. And also, since there's an atom in the story, the atom has these processes like spontaneous emission, which introduce extra sources of quantum noise into the story. So in fact, what we find is, in order to reproduce the sort of a hysteresis loop in uh, the input-output characteristics of the device, we have to scan the input power actually relatively quickly. And in fact, if we slow down the way that we're ramping the input power, this hysteresis uh, uh, loop collapses. And the idea between, behind that is, well, if you take too much time in sweeping through the branch of the hysteresis curve, and so you allow, you, you take long enough that quantum fluctuations really start to have an effect, then you can observe kind of quantum jumps from the upper branch to the lower branch and vice versa. So, you know, if you sweep too slowly, these, uh, the hysteresis loop collapses, whereas if you sweep fast enough, you can still sort of see it in a kind of a kinetic way. All right, so this is again to show that um, using these fancy new systems, you can get nonlinear phenomena of a kind that have already been thought about as the basis for optical switching. Uh, and it's very appealing that you can start to see these things happening at very low energy scales. On the other hand, you really have to watch out for the effects of quantum fluctuations and what they do to the input upper properties of your system. Uh, so that gets me finally to look, you know, maybe the uh, integrating motivation slide uh, for this talk, uh, which just shows that um, you know, if you go to the websites of many, if not most, of the major semiconductor companies these days, you can find on most of those websites some sort of a blurb about um, integrated photonics as an ingredient that's going into the design of next generation computer chips. The idea there is roughly that, you know, we think about CMOS, uh, multi-core processors, so, you know, Pentium-style processors, you can make all the transistors smaller, you can pack more and more uh, processing cores onto a die, but uh, a major technology bottleneck is in actually moving bits around on the chip. And, you know, the idea is just as you make your wires smaller, uh, the resistances and the ohmic losses get higher. Uh, yeah, and you can even find that in a current generation of chip, more than half of the power that the chip is dissipating is just used to shuttle the clock bits around and, and silly things like that. And so, you know, you can think about fancy new electronic ways to get around that, but it also seems competitive to imagine making hybrid computer chips where your local computation is done electronically, but you actually move things around on the millimeter scale or longer using photons. Because, you know, you can move photons around with pretty much no energy cost. And so the thought is that industry is now starting to develop in a serious way an infrastructure for making highly integrated nanoscale photonic networks. Now the immediate focus in industry really seems to be on passive photonic devices, so simple waveguides and, and linear resonators and things like that. But when you start to sprinkle in the kinds of work that's going on in academia, the kinds of cavity QED uh, stuff that I've just uh, shown you, or related things happening in solid state systems that use quantum dots, nitrogen vacancy centers, et cetera, we're really starting to get a, get a handle on how you could add to that platform nonlinearities that could be used to make switching in these sorts of integrated photonic circuits at very, very low energy scales, which would indeed be very appealing as an ingredient in next generation classical information processing devices. And even if you're just thinking about classical processors, so we're not talking about quantum computing yet, simply the fact that you want to go to very low energy scales means that you have to worry about quantum fluctuations and, th and things like that, even if your information paradigm is strictly uh, classical. Okay, so integrated photonic circuits is something that's starting to come online. And so now, how, what does that have to do with feedback? Well, let me just quickly remind you that in electrical circuits of the kind that you've learned about as an undergraduate, uh, feedback motifs are everywhere. Right, so if you think about the way that you actually use an op-amp, uh, you never simply plug a signal into an op-amp and take the output. Right? You always wrap a feedback network around an op-amp in order to stabilize its gain. Right? So here's a simple example of, a, of an inverting amplifier. Uh, 
And so there is the output of the op amp. It goes around, goes through a resistor network, comes back to an input of the op amp. So that's a feedback loop. So this is a fam familiar example uh, that you use feedback in electrical circuits uh, to do stabilization or to put in another way to, to design robustness into your system. Because this way the overall gain of the inverting amplifier depends only on the ratio of the impedances here and not on the open loop gain of the op amp, which is a not very well controlled quantity. Another way that you use feedback, uh, even now going to digital logic, uh, so here's a famous example of something called a NAND latch. Right, so each one of these uh, sort of bulb-shaped things is a NAND gate. Right, so that's a, a simple logic gate that uh, performs a NAND function. And you know, a NAND gate has no memory. Right, it simply takes the values on its input and translates that, that to an, uh, a, a value on the output. It's a function. On the other hand, if you take two NAND gates and interconnect them in this funny figure eight sort of way, you can actually make a, a bistable latch. Uh, so if you just uh, kind of trace values around and think about consistency, if both of the input lines here are held at one, what you can see is that the outputs of this kind of a configuration have two stable states. You can either have it so that this output is one and that's zero, or vice versa, and they're both stable as they kind of have to be because of symmetry. Right? On the other hand, uh, if you pull one of these lines down to zero and then bring it back up, you'll find that when this is one and that's zero, uh, then, in fact, the only stable output is, the, is a particular one of 0, 1, uh, whereas if you pull the other line down, then this output has to be 1, and this output has to be 0. So that gives you a scheme for actually latching a bit into memory, so you pull a line low and then bring it up back high. And so depending on what the last such pull down you did was, the bistable latch will remember that value. So this is an, an interesting example of using feedback for synthesis, where the idea is we start out with elementary components that don't have any memory, but by using the right kind of feedback interconnection, we actually make a compound device that does have memory. So feedback is everywhere in circuits in general. And so the idea, of course, is that, well, classical feedback control theory is used to analyze the details of these sorts of situations, right? Like if I want to know about transient response, so I want to know about the details of the dynamics, or if I want to know, you know, how does Johnson noise in this resistor make it into the output, right? If I want to do noise analysis, we kind of need to use some, uh, you know, not completely elementary classical control theory to analyze what's going on in classical electrical circuits. And now the claim is, well, if we're interested in the future in engineering uh, integrated photonic circuits that have quantum mechanical behavior, either because we're trying to do quantum computing or simply because we're interested in very low energy scales, as the computer industry is, uh, then quantum, coherent feedback control and all of this nice quantum optic stuff, that's going to be the foundation for integrated photonic circuit theory. So um, let me just breeze through a few examples to show you just kind of by analogy how this all works. And whereas previous things that I've shown you have all been experimental results, I'm now going to kind of uh, do a hyperspace jump into things that are purely theoretical, but where the main idea here is to just get across the ideas of, of what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> so here, here again is a simple sort of optical resonator. We now just imagine resonant modes where the light travels around in the triangle. And if we incorporate some sort of very strong nonlinearity into a ring resonator like this, we can get another bistable sort of operation. Right, so remember, this will be the sort of thing where if I sweep the input power and look at the output power, then uh, I'll follow a low stable branch until I jump up to the upper branch, then I'll come back down and then and jump down like that. Right, so really what this plot is, is a plot of all the equilibrium solutions of the equations of motion classically, where there's a range where there are multiple equilibrium solutions, and you can generally show that this middle branch is unstable, and it's only the upper and lower branches that are stable. So classically, you would expect that if I held the input power at some, some value within this intermediate range, there would be two stable points for the output power of this device, and so it should be a thing that I can use very much like that bistable NAND latch that I just talked about. However, if you, if you imagine make the no, making the nonlinearity so small that this kind of, uh, sorry, if I imagine making the nonlinearity so large that this bistability effect happens in a regime of very low photon number, then you can do numerical simulations of how this device behaves, and you'll find that the output power actually doesn't stably sit at this value or that value, but rather there are quantum jumps where the output power will jump back and forth between these two possible uh, values that were stable in the classical model. And so there's a kind of quantum fluctuation destabilizing the switch operation. And you might ask, is there a way that I can use coherent feedback to stabilize this sort of behavior, kind of in analogy to the way that we wrap a, an impedance network around an op amp to stabilize its behavior in a classical electrical circuit? <coughs> 
So a very simple idea of that is simply that, well, I can take another nonlinear resonator and use it as the controller. So I can think about a situation where I take some light leaking out of the this kind of switch cavity. I uh, send it through this, uh, this controller resonator, and then I send it back into the first resonator. Right? So I make one of these uh, coherent feedback loops, but now where all the elements are nonlinear. And the basic intuition, so I'm just going to show you the results from a design that was done completely intuitively. So it's certainly not optimized in its parameters or anything like that. But there is a basic intuition where just you would like the light that returns into the original cavity to have a stabilizing influence uh, you know, when the, well, to, to have a, you would like the light returning to the cavity to kind of suppress the photon number when the photon number is already low, but to excite the photon number when the photon number is already high. Right, so you try to relatively stabilize these two different uh, uh, um, logic levels. And so here again, uh, you can model this kind of coherent feedback loop. In individual trajectories, you can see that indeed this kind of switching that occurs in open loop um, still happens, but at a suppressed rate when you turn on this kind of coherent feedback. And uh, you, know, you can look at the ensemble average behavior and show uh, in, in a clean way that the rate of this kind of spontaneous switching can be enhanced or suppressed depending on the overall phase of this feedback loop, uh, very much analogous to that first uh, disturbance attenuation kind of example that I went through. Right, so the idea here is that uh, you know, by taking nonlinear optical resonators as building blocks and thinking about coherent feedback loops, uh, by analogy to feedback loops in electronics, you can really start to see how to do things in a very uh, highly analogous way. Um, you can also use uh, coherent feedback for a kind of synthesis. So likewise, you can take a, a nonlinear resonator of that same exact kind, and you can make something that looks like an optical NAND gate. Uh, I'll just point out that you know, the operation of the NAND gate itself is going to be coherent in the sense that um, if you want to make a NAND gate that's actually cap capable of fan out, right, as you need in order to actually make circuits, um, what you find is that with a, with a nonlinear resonator, you have to make use of both the nonlinearity of the output power as a function of the input, and also the nonlinearity of the output phase as a function of the input power. If you do that and kind of wrap up your nonlinear cavity in an interferometer of some kind, you can actually make a NAND gate with a fan out of two. Right, so that's like that's you know an optical version of a NAND gate. And in fact, if you think about interconnecting a pair of those in the same kind of a figure eight uh, configuration, you can uh, show by simulation again that this uh, now also does behave like a latch. Right, so you can now give this system some memory such that if you pull the output levels low and let them back up to high, the system will remember that for some amount of time. Right, and so some numerical simulations of that kind of closed loop behavior. So here's a switching diagram. So what this is showing you is the output powers of the two different lines uh, when you first hold it into the set condition right, that makes the black trace high and the red trace low. If you let the set condition back up to the hold condition, it remembers that. Right, black high, uh, red low. If you now pull the reset line down, they swap places. So the black line goes low and the red line goes high. You let it back into the, into the hold condition and it remembers that. And you, know, you can cycle this as often as you like. On the other hand, uh, if you do a long enough simulation, you'll find that quantum fluctuations start to induce spontaneous transitions between the two, uh, the two logic states. So again, because we're being greedy and trying to uh, design these sorts of systems at extremely low power levels, the quantum fluctuations have a role even though the you know, kind of logic framework that we're working in is, is the familiar sort of deterministic binary classical logic. But you get the idea that you know, by sort of reasoning on the basis of familiar ideas from electronics, uh, we can start to go into this world where you know, we have very strong optical nonlinearities. This allows us to think about doing switching at very low energy scales. And that switching will uh, sort of produce output signals that are optical, so we can move those signals around over long distances also in a very low loss way. So there are the right kinds of building blocks to really think about uh, not, uh, sort of integrated nanophotonics as a platform for doing ultra low power information processing uh, in, in futuristic kinds of uh, uh, signal processing circuits. Now, the individual building blocks are things that we can design by hand, but we would like to have some methodology for analyzing and even designing large-scale complex networks of this kind. And so let me just briefly mention that some, this is something that our group is very interested in. Uh, and so the kind of state of the art of the software package that we have now is you can use your favorite schematic capture software, so GSCAM or, or something like that. You define a library of optical components right, where this you know, symbol for the NAND2 that really just represents that kind of nonlinear interferometer thing that I talked about on the last slide. So you use your mouse to place those components down on a grid. 
you use your mouse to connect the output lines to input lines of another device. And so this really implements that kind of a, a NAND latch configuration. And then uh, you just do this in a regular, the same exact uh, graphical design tools that you use for making electrical circuits. And you allow that uh, piece of software to output a net list that describes that circuit using a standard format like VHDL, or you can also do this in a, in a format called Modelica. Right? So your, your existing open source software just spits out a text file that describes what that, how, that, how the elements in that circuit are interconnected. Right? So for those of you who know VHDL, it might look like this. And so what we've now uh, defined, we've built a code base that will, it's a Python code, that will look at this output file and convert it into a quantum mechanical model for the operation of that overall photonic circuit. And those quantum mechanical models are things that we can either analyze by looking at their analytic form, or you can convert them into a form to do numerical simulations and analyze the behavior of your circuits, uh, of your circuits that way. And you know, for those who are interested, we can also, I mean, this is a very nice, by using a format like VHDL and thinking about net lists, we can even do hierarchical model reduction and other things like that, where you know, originally we might have thought of this NAND latch as a component with lots and lots of different parts that we initially describe microscopically in order to do simulations and to understand its behavior. But once we've understood its behavior, we can sort of make effective models for the behavior of one of these optical NAND latches. And any, if we want to make a circuit that employs a large number of them, we can replace the high dimensional ab initio model of each NAND latch with a much lower dimensional uh, effective model that has the same kind of input output characteristics. So in practice, for instance, we can take something that has a Hilbert space dimension of 5,625, and we find that we can replace it very effectively with something that only needs 38 dimensions. So a lot of these games that you play in, in SPICE and other sorts of physical modeling tools for classical electronics, we can directly translate that paradigm into uh, quantum photonics. So now just to, to close in the last few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, quantum computing and the role that these sorts of tools and ideas can play there, let me very briefly uh, flash up the idea of quantum error correcting codes. So you probably know that uh, in a classical error correcting code, there's some bit of information, which can be either zero or one, but now if we want to protect that bit of information against uh, corruption by noise, we can use a sort of a redundant coding and parity checks uh, to basically spread that information out into some larger number of bits. And so then even if one or two or three of those bits get corrupted, we can use the redundancy of the information to recover the originally encoded information using parity checks or something like that. Now in quantum information theory, we have very much the same idea. So the information is not now just a plain old bit. But if we think about a coherent superposition between a zero and a one, right? So a quantum superposition of a of a zero bit and a one bit, uh, then that's a that's a single quantum bit of information. And we can also ask about schemes for protecting that sort of quantum information from the uh, corrupting influences of noise. And so you can define quantum error correcting codes that, in fact, are very similar to classical uh, information. Uh, classical error correcting codes in their nature, they involve redundant coding, they involve a kind of a parity check, and then some operation to recover the initially encoded information. So of course, if you go out to a con quantum information conference and uh, you know, go to a session that talks about quantum error correction, people will show diagrams of things that they call quantum circuits. So an example of that is what's shown up here on the top. Now the way that you're supposed to read this thing is each of these horizontal lines that travels across the page, that represents the evolution in time of one quantum bit in the quantum code word. And so all of these uh, vertically connected structures, those are logic gates, right? So this, for instance, means that you're supposed to now, at this first step, you apply some logic gate that uh, couples together this qubit, that qubit, and that qubit. Then there's a quantum logic gate that couples this qubit, that qubit, and that qubit. Then you independently do three single qubit gates and you go forward. And so, yeah, you can think of this as a, as a circuit diagram, but you know, really it's a kind of a graphical pseudocode for an algorithm, right? Because it's telling you a sequence of things that you're supposed to do in time. Now that's very different from an electrical circuit diagram like this, right? Where this is an op amp, these are resistors, this is some sort of source. This actually tells you, here are three physical devices that I can pick out of my cabinet, and I should put them down on my breadboard and hook the input-output uh, ports together in this way. Right? So it's really a physical map showing me what components to put down and how to connect them. And once I've made that arrangement, all I have to do in order to get this thing to work is power it. Right? And so it's then supposed to function autonomously on its own. So that's uh, quite different from this kind of thing up here, which is really like a computer program. And so, um, you know, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could think about things like quantum error correction more in this sort of form?
And so and that's another kind of problem we've been attacking using these concepts uh, from photonic circuits. So here's an example of such a schematic. And I don't really have time to go into, the, into any of the details of this. Um, and this is, again, strictly theoretical work. But the idea is that uh, these five components, so Q1, Q2, Q3, R1, and R2, um, these are components that are like my cavity QED devices that I introduced in the first part of the talk. So it's a fixed sort of input-output device. It's got some input ports, some output ports. These lines are just showing you how to hook up the output ports of some components to the input ports of others. And the idea of all this now is that each one of these devices is something that doesn't require any control inputs or anything like that. And once I've made this interconnection of devices, right, say by, yeah, by creating these devices and, and using waveguides or something like that to hook the inputs and outputs together, all I need to do in order to get this thing to error correct is power it. And in this case, that means that I shine a laser beam in this port, I shine a laser beam in that port, I shine a laser beam in that port. Uh, and, you know, those laser beams should have power in a certain range, but, you know, the exact values of those don't matter. Right? There's some tolerance to the power supply fluctuations. And you know, they don't have to be perfectly constant. Um, you know, they don't have to vary in any specified way in time. They're really just supplying power. And it, the, by the nature of the feedback loops that are set up in this arrangement, this kind of a, a, of a system will just automatically and on its own execute a continuous form of, of quantum error correction. Uh, and so, you know, this particular network is shown, for those of you who know, uh, for a version of the three qubit bit flip code or equivalently the phase qubit code. You can go to an, uh, something like the short, a Bacon short code that uh, it's a nine qubit code that corrects for an arbitrary single qubit error. Um, and then, as I was saying, each of these devices that are drawn in that diagram, we can write down a sort of quasi realistic uh, physical cavity QED model for what that device should look like on the inside doesn't require any clocked inputs or anything like that. And then in order to um, go from the specifications of physical models of each of the components and a net list for how these things are, are interconnected, uh, we use a very convenient calculus that was uh, originally written down by James Gov and Matthew James, uh, where we use some uh, uh, operations called the series product and the concatenation product to kind of build up a circuit model on the basis of the input-output models for the individual components. And the idea of this, again, is that if I have drawn my circuit model using a CAD program like I showed before, what our Python script will do is compile that VHDL netlist into an expression like this, which we can in turn reduce all the way down to a simple master equation or something like that um, using uh, just a regular old operator algebra. And so, at the end of the day, we can obtain something like an analytic master equation for the overall operation of the circuit. And, you know, this is something where, uh, well, if anybody's interested, I can tell them about it later. But if you know something about how uh, all this quantum optics works, you can look at the form of the equation that you've ended up with at the end of the day. And you can really understand how this uh, circuit works and what the important parameters are. You can also do things like numerical integrations of these equations of motion to see how, by increasing the feedback strength, you, um, you know, a stronger and stronger uh, feedback strength makes the protection of the encoded information better and better and better as a function of time. So it really, it behaves like a feedback loop in the sense that you don't have to do any fine tuning of the parameters. There's an, an overall feedback strength and the general idea is that the stronger the feedback, the better. So there's a kind of gain margin in this sort of a setup. And so the last thing to, to flash up before I finish is just to note that, um, you know, I was talking with a few people uh, earlier in the day that I realized that this kind of uh, idea of going from a net list into a physical model of how a circuit works, this is, of course, something that people already do in, in classical electronics. They also use it for things like uh, circuit validation and circuit synthesis, right? So really making the connection between a low-level physical description of a circuit and a high-level functional description. And one of the tools that people use there is a, is a funny kind of mathematics called uh, term rewriting. And so we've also recognized the um, utility of this kind of approach in what we're doing. And so we find things that, uh, you know, in the early days of, of working on these kinds of systems, um, you know, like I actually wrote out this network expression for the quantum bit flip code by hand and did all these reductions by hand to arrive at this master equation. Nowadays, what we do instead is we draw a diagram like this in a CAD program and use an automated uh, routine to compile it down to a master equation like this. But in fact, more than being just a matter of convenience, what we've started to understand is that there's utility to being able to represent circuits like this at multiple levels of, of abstraction. Because certain things that you might want to do, 
like suppose we want to think about um, this kind of a, a quantum error correction circuit and we want to analyze, well, you know, uh, initially I'm imagining maybe that there are no propagation losses as optical fields travel um, from output ports to input ports. But maybe I would like to investigate the effect of propagation losses and how those degrade the performance of the circuit. You could do that by hand, but you know, even for this simple circuit that's pages and pages of algebra, and it's basically beyond the patience of any graduate student to do it for this network right here. And in fact, if you try to add in losses when you already had things at this level of description, you could do it, but it would be very cumbersome. Uh, but what's very natural to do is when you have it at the net list level, right, so when you're looking at this level of description of just what are the connections in the circuit, you can write a few lines of code in a, you know, Mathematica or some other term rewriting kind of uh, uh, environment, and just a few lines of code will transform the net list into a net list that contains optical losses in it, and then you apply your automated uh, uh, parsing algorithm to reduce it to an expression uh, like this and then to this, that you can then analyze analytically or do num numerical simulations on. On the other hand, um, you know, there are some things that you can't do very well at the netless level, and those include things like model reductions, like adiabatic eliminations. So certain kinds of approximations that you want to make at a physical level, you really need to do at the level where you're looking, where you're staring at the operator algebra. So at this level of representation or even this one. Right, so there are different levels of, of abstraction that are useful in describing circuits like this. And, um, yeah, we're starting to sort of draw lots of analogies to uh, how all of this stuff works in the integrated photonic circuit setting, uh, both for quantum information pr processing purposes and for ultra low power classical information processing. And we're starting to see very much how that connects to um, classical methods and ideas in, in, in regular electrical engineering. And so, you know, I, I, I get very excited about this stuff because it really feels like, you know, we're taking general approaches that we have learned that we know are good from classical engineering, but we're now kind of ramping them up so that they will be applicable for next generation devices that rely on coherence because they're trying to run with very low power dissipation and they uh, work in these regimes where the quantum mechanics can't be ignored. But it's kind of nice to see that you can still use uh, tried and true engineering approaches, which we know are very powerful, but just by kind of changing what's under the hood, uh, you can uh, make those approaches valid even for these systems that are operating in this very quantum mechanical fashion. So that's really the, the long-term vision of this stuff that we're trying to do. So let me just leave you with a, a very old picture of the group. I'm afraid I'm not doing too much justice to the people who are currently there. Let me just mention that a lot of this work on the uh, photonic circuit theory was done by Joe Kirchhoff, uh, who's now uh, a postdoc at, uh, at Jilla. Um, and then a lot of this work on uh, the, the sort of net list and QHDL. Dmitry Pavlichin and Gopal Sarma were two of the people uh, involved. Here's Henry Nerdin, who visited our group for some time. Uh, the, some of the younger graduate students who are working on the Python code and such, Nicholas Tizak, uh, Dongbang Tsai. Unfortunately, they didn't make it into this photo. Uh, but you can you know, see a complete listing of, of current people in the group and find some preprints, uh, reprints and stuff like that at our, at our website here. So thanks very much. Since you do this coherent uh, process, you can actually change the whole circuit. 
a connection to one more element. So does your, does your code take that into account when it, when it, when it, uh, when it, when it simulates or, 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 or models these, these elements? Yeah, you know, so in the simplest version of this, you'll note that we generally tend to model the cavities as ring resonators. So there's a certain sense where, uh, you know, the input that comes into one, the reflection of that goes off in a different direction. And in many cases, you'll be able to set things up so that there's negligible direct backscattering of the light back to the earlier component. Now, if you want to put that backscattering in, you can. It, redu it increases the dimensionalities of all the models in, in, a, in a not so nice way. But fundamentally, that kind of thing can be included in these... Uh, in this modeling approach. And in fact, we've been starting to work with people at Jilla for doing exactly this sort of thing for super, superconducting circuit QED models. And there you have to take into account the backpropagation. And so that is easily incorporated, although it's not so nice for the dimensionality of the models. But you know, these sorts of abstractions of um, you know, infinite input impedance, zero output impedance, those are very convenient things to have in, in electrical circuit design. Um, you don't necessarily have those kinds of ideas in um, in this sort of photonic uh, design, but let me you know, shift the question just a little bit and note that one of the very nice things that we've found in doing this kind of model modeling is that there are other sorts of abstractions that you can make in, in nanophotonics. One of the very interesting ones is something that we've called the small volume limit. So the small volume limit is this idea where if, our, if my cavity QED devices are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, as they do in you know, photonic crystals or other sorts of nanophotonic uh, uh, implementations, you know, the, the parameter that we call the vacuum Rabi frequency tends to get large. The cavity decay rates also get large at the same time. And there's a very nice thing, so you can use a limit theorem for these kinds of models that shows that in that simultaneous limit, you often have situations where something that you would originally describe as a complicated dynamical system that has lots of dimensions internally, in this limit where the couplings get very strong but also the the rate at which photons come in and out gets very large, you can actually replace that model with a very low dimensional scattering matrix model, which is a funny sort of scattering matrix in that the uh, matrix elements are operators, but the dimensionality drops way down and it becomes immediately apparent what the functionality of the device is just by staring at that scattering matrix. So there are simplifying uh, approximations that you can make that are very natural in nanophotonics, but they're different than the ones that you use in, in electrical circuits. Um, I don't think that the, the computational complexity of parsing the circuits, it's not going to be any different than it is in, in, elect, in, the, in the electronic setting. Right? You're just trying to kind of resolve graphs and things like that. Um, you mean, but what gets much worse much more quickly is the complexity of simulating these things. Right? So if all you're after is an analytic expression for the network model, that's something that I think we can do out to you know, a much higher number of components that we're gonna ma than we're going to make in the foreseeable future. But doing numerical simulations of those things can be quite bad. Uh, because, you know, the sizes of the Hilbert spaces are multiplying. Um, and so if you really want to think about modeling systems like this for quantum computing, that, that's going to be a limitation to the largest um, circuits that we can really uh, analyze. I mean, just to sell you, tell you something embarrassingly bad, you know, for the nine qubit bacon shark codes that we've been looking at, uh, at some points in the constructions of those models, we actually out of memory on our servers that have six terabytes of RAM. So the models can get pretty large. Um, but for these other purposes of looking at quantum optical models for ultra-low power classical signal processing, we actually believe, although we haven't completely worked out yet, that there's a mean field theory that you can use where you treat each uh, component quantum mechanically, but you treat the interconnections in mean field. And so this actually gets rid of the exponential scaling of the overall size of the state space, and you go back to something where, where every time you add a component, you just add on some number of Hilbert space dimensions. And we think that's really going to allow us to look at very large networks. Uh, well, you know, large enough to think about, you know, counters and other, thing, uh, other useful sorts of uh, circuit configurations. Maybe one last thing that I'll mention because I forgot. I mean, again, making the connection to, uh, to classical control theory, you know, in a setting where you have noise, you know, measurement noise and process noise, the kinds of models that, that one typically uses to, to, to represent a feedback loop like this, right, you'll write down uh, stochastic differential equations, right, that's the natural uh, model. 
I should just mention that you know, this kind of framework that's uh, investigated by my Matthew James and co-workers and that underlies all of these methodologies that we're using, they're based on quantum stochastic differential equations. So they're very much the same kind of thing, except that the quantities in the QSDEs are non-commutative. And so you have a non-commutative Edo table and other stuff like that. So I mean, really, the formalism looks a whole lot like what you're already familiar to in stochastic control. It's just that now things don't commute. Um, but you know, the, the, there are a lot of very nice formal uh, analogies. Yeah, so, so what you end up doing is you end up, so the things that are easy to compose are the QSDEs. So you compose the QSDE for the overall network model, but then you sort of go to the adjoint representation, right? And so the master equation propagates the probability, the thing that's like the probability density, rather than propagating the variables themselves that you have in the QSDE. Oh, yeah. And they were somehow incorporated in, in by accounting for the right places in which fluctuation led to the problem. Yeah, you know, so you have vacuum fields going in and out of the circuit. Those things all end up um, inducing dissipation terms in the master equation. But that all gets handled in a very automated way. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we certainly don't think about that very much. I mean, you know, so there's this kind of geometric approach to optimal control that others have used in designing optimal control policies for, let's say, for doing open loop things on spins. You know, these sorts of methods are really most powerful in situations where there are noises and for doing stabilization and, and problems like that. Um, the kind of pulse sequence design work that you referred to in magnetic resonance, those largely come in, in physical scenarios where the correlation times of the environmental noise are very long, right? And so you're in very much a non-Markov limit. And so a lot of what you're doing in these pulse sequence designs is trying to somehow average out the effects of the background where they have a relatively constant value, but it's an unknown value. And so you can use open loop techniques to really decouple your system of interest from the environment. Here in all these optical things, we're generally working in the opposite limit, where the correlation time of the environment is very short. And so we have a Markovian model for the environmental interactions. And that's the one where things like quantum error correction are really the, the methods that come into play. Um, you know, so the, the challenges and the kinds of design problems that you have in the magnetic resonance world and in the optics world, they're, they're almost disjoint. Um, and so, you know, these kinds of uh, composition methods and other stuff like that, I guess I don't know of anybody doing that in the magnetic resonance side. Although, you know, it would obviously be a very nice thing to look into.